Carter from Montgomery, Alabama. I'm Hawk on the LOC's website. I got two toy guns right here. You two met Got a 45. Colt look alike. That right there. P92 look alike. We're going to use these in a demonstration. They both got a wooden dowel driven down into the barrel. These were the uh, five millimeter pellet guns. So we got one here. Makes a good noise. The 45 used to, but it broke. <laughs> so when I shoot George, I will <laughs> bang. <laughs> it's mine, George. You're going to carry Well, I went and took my 45 and put it in the car. That way I won't be tempted. <laughs> <laughs> now make sure that that's the right one. <laughs> George, you really need to check this out. So that clip looks a lot like 22. See my dowel I put in there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, got your other one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even bump a bullet at you. I'm accustomed to drawing from an open carry hole. So that's why I'm using this. Welcome, everybody. The course is handgun self-defense. We're going to talk more about what you can do and how you can do it than anything else. First of all, we'll talk about weapons. Weapon selection is usually a big deal for every person. Can y'all hear me in the back? Good. <clears throat> the caliber of it, the shot capacity, those are all big deals to us. The size of the gun, you want to match to how you're going to use it. The caliber, you want something that's effective, right? Something that's got several shots. We put a lot of importance on that. We spend a lot of time worrying about that. We even trade guns because we found something that we want better. But for our purposes in self-defense, that is not of critical importance. Of all the calibers out there, in a 10-year study that was done on one-shot stops, okay, the people that were stopped, the, uh, an attacker who was stopped in his tracks with one shot, anybody know what handgun caliber came out on top of everything else? Ooh, ooh, ooh. 32 ACP. Now, how many of you have run out lately to try to find you a great 32 ACP? Well, I just don't think that's on the popularity list. It ranked number one in accuracy. Also, it also ranked number one in the failure to incapacitate the attack. <laughs> So, that information comes from a report that I got from BuckeyeFirearms.org and the name of it is an alternate look at handgun stopping power. It's by Greg Elifritz. And it is a fantastic piece of information. This guy did a 10-year study on his own of actual shootings where there were multiple shots involved. This is a great read and I recommend it. If anybody wants to look through it, I do have a copy here. I don't have any for you to take for you. It was about eight, nine pages long. But I strongly recommend that you go to the website and read that article. So the 32 came in last place. Let's talk about why it came in first place. If you carry a 32, you have left your macho at home. You're most likely going to use that at this distance. 
and you're going to use it like a staple gun. Chacoon, chacoon. <laughs> your accuracy goes through the roof. Your effectiveness is wonderful. But let's learn something from that. That's important. If you carry a small gun, use it like a staple gun. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about shock capacity. I'm not even going to discuss gunshot capacity. After you double tap, if they ain't running, they all <laughs> put <laughs> Methods of care. You know, you can use anything at home. You can use a shotgun, rifle, whatever you got. I'm not going to even get into the effectiveness of that. Okay. That's a whole other subject that we do need to cover. But basically, as far as outside your home, you can carry in a vehicle. And that gives you some options when you're in your vehicle and you're in a position to access it. But that doesn't help you when you get outside your vehicle. Doesn't help you if it's locked in the glove box. You will not likely have time to unlock the glove box and get your gun. There will be a few times that you might. It might make you feel better. But don't ride around thinking that because it's locked in the glove box, you've got a quick option because you don't. Quick is the key. Concealed carry, you can use a handbag if you're a female and carry a handbag, or male, male carry a handbag now. <laughs> Briefcase. Shoulder bag, that's what I should have said. Waistband, and carry it in your pocket. Calf holster. And there's some new holsters out for ladies. Thigh holsters that accommodate a tremendous number of uh, options. And there's a, there's a good video online about that too. But if you carry concealed, <coughs> You're back to the same situation you had in your vehicle. Access time. If you're going to carry a weapon concealed, practice drawing from your concealment area. Because you're going to have a time delay in accessing your weapon. That means your situational awareness needs to be a whole lot higher. Okay? Because you need to buy yourself time to access your weapon. Another method of carry is open carry. A lot of people went through life didn't know it just was available to us. I was one of them until I met Alabama open carry, and Alabama gun rights. Now I know that's an option, and I choose to use that option every day, everywhere I go, almost. Before we get off subject of methods of carry, <coughs> Let's talk about this one just a moment. The handbag. Young lady, would you please stand up? Come on up here. Yeah. I want you to turn around and face the people, please. Ladies, this is how I want you to carry your gun. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are a woman, aside from sexual assault, what are what crime are you most likely to become a victim of? If you have your gun in your purse, you have just escalated a routine purse snatching into a fight over a weapon. You do not want to have to try to draw your weapon from your purse while trying to fight someone for possession of that purse. He's bigger than you are, he's stronger than you are, he's probably faster than you are, and it is a fight you will lose. And if he gets your weapon, he may react very badly to you being armed. And on that same, excuse me, just one second. <laughs> Jeans and her 
her holster is low. That's fine, but the way that women are shaped in the hip, a lot of times your gun will cant in toward the body and make it difficult to draw. If hers was up another two inches, this would be pointed into this area and it would be less comfortable to draw. By rotating your holster slightly forward, it allows you to bypass that curved area into an area that's in transition and will allow you to get that gun out quickly. A lot of times you can go forward or you can go a little bit further back. Very few of you can go further back. Forward. <laughs> Everybody, everybody tilt that gun a little bit? Yeah, it might go the other way. Depends on what kind of holster you got. I got a question. Yeah. Okay, like, I have a beauty salon, and I work a lot at night. Uh -huh. And sometimes I'm the last one leaving. Uh -huh. And I have to go out the back door, and it's dark, and I go out alone. If I have it, and I go I out the door idea. with it in my hand. That's the shortcut because the intent was to get it in your hand start with. No, can, I, I'm can I have it in my hand yeah. to carry it out the door? I mean, yeah. my next door to us was robbed a couple, well, about a month ago. Right. She's got a good robbed. point. The other form of carry is in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add that to the slides. I've got to add to the slides. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate so it. So I can go out my business. Yeah. With it in yes. my hand. I would do that in the dark on the way out of the back. Since the bank got robbed, the cops do come right. come through there periodically. For the rest of the time, please get a holster because if you go and chop in and stuff, people are going to wonder. Have you ever made the deposit bag? No. Go to the bank, go get a deposit bag, and just carry that with you because if a police officer is driving by, and he sees you with a gun in your hand, it's going to pique his interest. But if you got a bank bag in your hand, maybe not so much. There's a lot of pros and cons to different types of carry. We discussed in your vehicle, access, search in the vehicle, conceal carry, something you can do anytime, anywhere. It's going to delay your time of bringing that weapon into action if you need it. Open carry provides you faster access to your weapon if you practice. If you're not going to practice, if you're not proficient with a firearm, please do not open carry. Is that clear? If you're not proficient with a firearm, please do not conceal carry. Guns are two. Why have a tool you don't know how to use? You could hurt yourself. Boss, we have a question. Talk about uh, concealed, what you're going to the bed be concealed. A lot of people are saying ask questions about it. On a motorcycle, is that in a vehicle? A motorcycle is considered to be transportation. The law in Alabama says you must have a license to transport. It does not <coughs> specify specifically in a vehicle. But on a motorcycle is considered in a vehicle for the same as. What what is actually printed on the back on your on your permit does say or in a vehicle. I understand. The concealed carry license is actually now two licenses in one. This is a permit to carry a pistol revolver on or about your person, concealed or in a vehicle. So it's another license that they added to it and putting it into one ball of wax. That chunk of the license is against the Constitution. Also, it's entirely possible that if you have a weapon in your vehicle uh, and you don't have a permit that it could be considered your personal property and you may get off that way don't know we we need a test case anybody's interested <laughs> jump on that but you gotta have a license to transport I to talk to jason tully before you 
Yes, it's beside the ball. Yes, ma'am. What about carrying a pistol on a four wheeler on a non public highway? <coughs> well, they're going to consider it transportation. If it's a motorized vehicle, bicycle, you're good. Motorized vehicle, you're in dangerous territory. But, okay. Anybody got any more questions about the license deal? It's, it's two things in one. You've got to have it to transport. Transport's a key word. Even if it's in your trunk? Perfect. Your car? I, think you're good. I think you're good to go if the weapon's in your trunk. Okay. Sir? Does all the permits in Alabama or just some of the counties on the back of the permit that say this permit does not give you permission to carry your gun openly? Okay. That permit does not give you permission to carry a gun openly. Right. They added that statement for confusion of the planet, and it's working. Right. The Constitution allows you to carry a gun openly. Right. So they had that on there for confusion, and so far, so good. So you just live in the wrong county. If you come down to Mobile, you get a Anything that's on the back of your permit are your sheriff's rules. Yeah. Right. Now, so it's he's, not all over Alabama. He's no. got discretion to take your permit away. Right. If he doesn't like the looks of your face. Or if he doesn't like me carrying open. Exactly. Sir. You mentioned going to the bank and getting the bank bag. Wouldn't that kind of pique the interest of a bad guy? <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. She could throw it. We're not going to add bank bag to her. <laughs> <laughs> Get a paper sack, stick the gun in a paper sack, stick your finger through the paper yeah, sack. A hardy bag. <laughs> roll, 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 roll. Just, just carry the, the paper bag around the gun. Yeah, we all felt real safe until somebody decided to go in and rob the bank right next door with a gun. You're on the next slide. Oh. So then we decided we were going to go I'm good. I'm right there with you. Yeah, I'm Want to talk about the variables that you're going to be facing in self defense? Identification of a threat, identification of the avenues of retreat. When you're driving, you have learned to become accustomed to looking down the road, paying attention to what's going on, so that it gives you a head up before you get to what's going on. You've done it so much, it's first nature, not even second nature. You can do the same thing with this. You need to buy yourself time to defend yourself. You need to identify the threat at the earliest possible time. You need to identify any way that you can avoid the threat at the earliest possible time. When you go into a room, find out where the exits are right then. That also tells you where the entrances are. So you know where to look for trouble to come from. Don't sit with your back to the door. I don't. <laughs> Identifications of the avenues of retreat will also give you some identification of the avenues of threat. Identification of available cover or concealment. Concealment is something that hides the outline of your body. Cover is something that deflects or will absorb bullets. And you can get into the habit when you're entering a place of getting a feel for, yeah, I could die behind that and it might stop something. It might stop these, it might not stop those. Uh, that's a good thing to look for. And you can get in the habit of doing that and it might save you a lot. The distance to the threat. This is the tricky part. Most shootings occur with the aggressor and defender less than 15 feet apart. When I go to the range, I set my targets up at 15 feet. That is incredibly close, people. How about this? Yeah. At this distance, the statistics say is what you're going to have to defend yourself at. Now, I'm going to add something to that. If you want to take shots longer than that, you're going to have some splaining to do. 
If you take headshots, you're going to have some splaining to do. Yes, you're a very good shot. You're very accurate. It's called execution. But what if somebody is in your house and you shoot them and you get them in the head? I'm just telling you. You have some explaining to do. Okay. You have to be. Able That's all I'm saying. In the shooting scenario, personally, I go over and make sure that he had another one in him somewhere. <laughs> He's got one in the head. I'm gonna say, mm -hmm. no. I got the headshot on the rise. <laughs> I'm just saying. Listen, everybody's familiar with the Trayvon Martin case, right? This is only one thing I'm gonna say about this. Two people came out of that, and neither one of them have got a life. Whether it's justified or not, that deal went south. So you need to think about that. You need to pre-think about what you're going to do, what you're willing to do, and what you ought to do. One guy asked me if he could shoot the guy uh, 42 feet away. I said, sure. Of course you can. And, you and then you've got to deal with it. <laughs> because after you're shooting, there's going to be a shooting review. And the people that are going to review it are not going to be anybody that was there, anybody who was scared, or anybody who owes you money. It's going to be somebody looking at scientific evidence that George was a threat to me. The further he is away, the harder it is for me to justify he was a threat unless he's got a weapon that operates further away. If the only weapon on the planet was a sword, all I would have to do is hold my sword between me and George. If he kept coming, what would happen? He would impale himself. So I didn't kill him. He didn't. Because <laughs> I told him, George, don't come over here. I'm serious. I've got the sword. And George kept coming. All right. If I've got a 45 on my hip and I tell George I'm putting my hand on my gun, this is finished. You are threatening me to the point I am convinced you're going to hurt me. That was his last warning. H-O-W, hand on weapon. If you open carry and you put your hand on your weapon, you had better be serious. Because you just escalated the situation to lethality when you put your hand on that gun. Hand off gun, I'm not touching it. That's one thing. I can justify that in this way. Yes, I had a gun, no, I didn't touch it. That's one thing. When I do this, I have become a threat. So now I'm telling George, you are threatening me and I am not gonna go any further with it. Now, George is less, 15 feet away or less. If he's got a machete, he can be here really quick. So just take a couple of quick strides for me, George. Yeah, don't, don't walk me on the head, man. <laughs> you see what happened? I had my hand on my weapon. I draw from the hand on weapon in less than half a second. Less than 0.5 seconds. With my hand off my weapon, my normal weapon, from the time that I start moving my hand until that gun is fired the first shot is 0.76 seconds. I practice a lot. 15 feet, that man's going to cover that and probably stick me with a pig sticker. Yes, I put a 45 in him. He might kill me, but I'm going to cut him. Yeah, if he's got a gun, I'm in real trouble. But I can justify that shooting. I can justify it. Now, what I would really do, I'd say, George, <laughs> you need to put that knife with us, and I'm going to back up as far as I can go. <clears throat> so I'll shoot him full the way if I can, because I know he can cover that distance that quick. Here is the problem with self-defense, folks. 
if George makes the decision when this is going to go down, which he has to, otherwise it's not self-defense. Is that right? Right. All right. If he makes that decision, he has at least a .62 second advantage on me. Because from the time he makes a motion till the time my brain sees it, transfers the signal to the hand on my weapon, takes that long. George, I'm just going to wait until you do your thing and I'm going to do mine. I just got shot. And I just got back shot. And I shot him in the back. Now we both got some splaining to do. <laughs> I was in fear for my life. I was trying to run away. And he shot me in the back, so I shot him in self-defense. I hope he missed. But I have got some splaining to do. That happened to policemen so much. They were coming in telling their supervisors, hey, I had my gun out. Now the policeman can't point his gun at the guy because he don't see the weapon yet, okay? If he does, he's taking it to lethal. So y'all remember that next time the cop got points a gun at you. <clears throat> Cop's got his gun down like this. The guy does what George just did. By the time he can go from there to there and squeeze that trigger, he shot the man in the back. Let's run that. Yeah, let's run that video. Let's run that video. I want y'all to see just how fast the young men can do that. Speed is everything. Everything. Accuracy is everything. Caliber, I don't care. Don't care what gun you use, what type it is. If it works, fine. If you're happy with it, fine. Speed is everything. Accuracy is everything. Timer's right down here on the bottom. He's getting that done in half a second. Now you see, you can't even see his gun behind his leg. So you can't point your gun at him. And by the time you can, he's got a shot off at you. That's not good. If somebody has come into your house. I, we, we need to get what, through this. Then we'll okay. take the question. You, you Hold that thought. You want to show the other one then? Yeah, I want to show you how fast this lady can draw. She is initiating now. She is deciding when to do this. She does that in point two six. Yeah, point two six seconds. That, that's from inside the waistband of her pants. Yeah. She comes out and gets that shot off in point two six seconds. So if your lady friend is standing there and saying, I've had it with you, George, <laughs> be careful what you say, because you may not finish the sentence. <laughs> Let's go back and find my anatomy chart. I think it's on the next slide up there. Speed of accessing your weapon. And that's why I say open carry gives you an advantage in that department. A lot of people who are pro concealed carry and anti open carry say they're that way because concealed carry gives them a tactical advantage because they have the element of surprise. I understand that. I, I concealed carry for 35 years. The surprise is you can't get your gun out. <laughs> I carried an ankle holster in my boot for 35 years knowing that I was going to be doing this while the bad guy did whatever he wanted to do. <laughs> this is what I call the shot placement zone. It represents the solid organs of the body. Lungs here are shown only for reference. That triangle is the top half of the center rings of a B-27 police target. You put shots down in here, they're full of duds. Okay, they may be full of breakfast, or yesterday's breakfast. But your best chance of getting a one-shot stop, if there was such a thing on the planet, 
is to put your shot inside this triangle in one of these blood-filled organs. If you've got a mushroom in ammunition, it's going to mushroom in those organs because they're full of blood. If you cut somebody bloodstream so that it's dumping at full speed, it still takes a minute to bleed to death. It takes a minute for your own heart to pump your blood out. A lot can happen in a minute. You remember the Borders commercial you ever saw? That may only last in 60 seconds. Yeah, seems like forever. So when I train, this is what I train at. And I train at 15 feet. And what I do is HOW, hand on weapon, DAD, draw and double tap. When I come out of the holster, I'm torquing my trigger right here on my double action. And by the time that gun goes level, it's fired. And then my second shot goes off right here. I want to get the first shot off. I want that cap do dodging, ducking, grits in his eyes, whatever. I want to get the first shot off, if there's any way possible, because it gives me an advantage. If my first shot can go into the attacker, so much the better. But I'm on double tap. Because by the time you double tap, you carry a double action, single action, like a lot of guns are, you're in the single action mode then, your trigger pulls less, your accuracy is better. By the time you get up here, <coughs> you're ready for your second shot of your double tap. So with practice, I've gotten my second shot off by the time I get right there. There's a few folks in here seen me do it. <coughs> I'm a lot slower than the young guys. They can draw faster than me, and they can double tap faster than me. The only advantage that I've had up until recently was I was more accurate in getting those shots in that triangle. Lately, somebody did better than that. Did better than that. Back that. By a lot. Back that. Yeah. Oh. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Where did that come from? Right here. Okay. Uh, your first acronym was H O W, and then you said D A D. D A D. Draw and double tap. Thank you. How dad? Because I'm old. And all the young guys are, how, Dad? <laughs> by time, if possible, by distance, if at all possible. Use the time and distance to your tactical advantage in surrounding. That's what this is all about, is time and distance. The distance the attacker is to you is going to give you a stronger case in court for self-defense the closer I allow that threat to get to me or the higher that threat level is that can be recorded in physical evidence the better off I am from a self-defense standpoint as far as proving my case that's secondary tertiary quadrary whatever don't mean nothing you're not supposed to use your gun unless you have absolutely no choice you don't care what the circumstances are after the fact. But what you can do now is train. Practice, practice, practice. Practice at 15 feet. Practice putting your bullets in the big part. And that might save your life because it may stop an attack. But time and distance can be an ally or your worst enemy. If they're too close and they initiate, you're at a double disadvantage. So, your awareness level needs to be as high as possible so that you identify the threat as far away as possible and it buys you time to do your thing before that threat arrives. Does that make sense? So time and distance, speed and accuracy. That's what you've got to work on. You can work on speed and accuracy. There's not much you can do about time and distance until you're in that situation. Except if you work on speed and accuracy, 
you have solved part of the time and distance problem because your presentation time of your weapon is faster. All right. That's it, folks. One quick question I'd like to ask before you dismiss here. All right. You have not spoken about uh, having the right attitude being willing to shoot. Would you comment or two on that? That should be a decision that you make when you get in or not in the gun business. If you're not resolved within yourself as to what you can or can't do, then you need to put the gun away until you get that resolution straight in your head. That'll tell you whether you should pick it up again or not. But a weapon is a tool, a self-defense tool. It's a very long sword. In my example of holding the sword between me and the threat. Now, if you're not willing to apply that tool mentally, psychologically, morally, leave it in the drawer. It's not for you. Some people can't. It's not a big deal, but you've got to go through that in your mind and get that out of the way so that when it does come time that you need it, there won't be a hesitation. Yes, sir? Uh, might want to mention that it's not unmanly to haul ass and get away. Yeah. <laughs> I, teach, I teach a self-defense course. <laughs> and I'll be glad to answer a lot more questions and give you a lot more info. That's all we have time for today. I appreciate it, folks. If anybody's got any questions, come on in. I'll be